So, auf meiner Seite herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zur Lecture- und Filmreihe Tropical Underground. Wir sind sehr glücklich, dass so viele gekommen sind für eine neue Folge dieser Veranstaltung. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass heute Christopher Dunn gekommen ist aus äh, USA, um heute über Meteorengo Kid ähm, zu sprechen. Ähm, ich äh, wollte nur ganz kurz äh, hinweisen, wie der Ablauf des Abends ist. Ich glaube, die meisten von äh, Ihnen kennen das schon, äh, die die Reihe schon äh, seit Oktober hier folgen. Wir werden zunächst die, äh, den Vortrag hören, dann haben wir eine kleine Pause, wo das äh, Café oben noch geöffnet ist, dann äh, geht es los mit dem Film und danach gibt es noch ein kleines Gespräch äh, mit dem Gast und äh, wir freuen uns sehr, wenn alle auch bleiben und darüber zu sprechen. Ähm, genau, ich will nicht äh, viel sprechen, ich äh, lade hier äh, Professor Vincent Rediger, um ein paar Wörter über unsere Gast des Abends zu, zu sprechen und ich wünsche alle ein sehr spannende äh, Abend hier im Filmmuseum. Dankeschön. So, guten Abend von meiner Seite auch in diesem, bei diesem schönen vorweihnachtlichen Anlass. Andere Leute singen Lieder und spielen Händel und wir schauen brasilianisches Underground Kino an. Um, The subtitle of the series is uh, The Brazilian Cinema Marginal, the Bra Brasilianische Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos, The Brazilian Cinema Marginal and the Revolution of Cinema, which is a very militant title. Uh, but uh, we actually were serious about the whole revolution thing. Uh, and the people who made these films were quite serious about it too, uh, as were uh, some of their contemporaries in, in other arts. Um, there was a moment... Uh, in actually I think 68 or 69 when Caetano Veloso, the famous Brazilian singer and one of the protag protagonists of the Tropicalia movement um, uh, played a concert together with Os Mutantes, uh, a hard rock psychedelic rock group uh, from Brazil and there was a lot of feedback and a lot of uh, you know rock music sounding uh, uh, noises And the audience didn't like what they heard. Uh, it was a student audience. And they started booing um, the band and Caetano Viloso, who they had come to hear and were very fond of, basically. So uh, Caetano Viloso stopped the show <clears throat> and started talking to the audience and basically started, uh, you know, uh, trying to teach the student audience about the relationship between aesthetics and politics. And one of the core lines that he said during his speech lecture was if your aesthetics are your if your politics are you like are like your aesthetics, then we're all screwed. Uh, so basically what he was saying is if you don't have a revolutionary taste in music and cinema, your politics are not going to be worth the salt if you call yourself a revolutionary. So if your if your taste is backwards, then your politics are going to be backwards. How do I know this? Because I was obviously not there. I was born the year that happened. Um, <clears throat> I know this because I read Chris Dunn's books. Uh, Christopher Dunn, if you will, is uh, the, you know, the universal genius of Brazilian counterculture of the 60s and 70s. He's the author of two books, which I Uh, warmly recommend you read, not just because of the breadth and depth of their erudition, but also because of the way they're written. Um, they're eminently readable books, uh, wonderfully, it's a wonderful flowing prose, uh, and uh, it's written by someone who's knowledgeable in literature, in music, in cinema, in the visual arts, uh, knows the politics of Brazil and the culture and the cultural history of Brazil very well, as you will see Uh, in his lecture tonight, and uh, he he really is someone who um, you 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 couldn't do much better than to pick uh, Christopher Dunn's books uh, if you want to get uh, a sense of what is really happening in the cultural and historical moment uh, that we're studying here together in this particular series. Christopher Dunn is a professor of Spanish and Portuguese literature at Tulane University in New Orleans uh, in the United States, uh, where he also serves as the director of undergraduate studies in Portuguese and Brazilian literary and cultural studies. Uh, he earned his 
PhD, his doctorate from Brown University in 1996, and immediately thereafter started teaching at uh, Tulane University. And his uh, publications include the two books that I already talked about, Brutality Garden, Tropicalia, and the Emergence of a Brazilian Counterculture, which was published in 2001. And more recently, Contra Cultura, Alternative Arts, and the Social and Social Transformation in Authoritarian Brazil, which uh, came out in 2016. Both of these books um, were published by University of North Carolina Press, and you can get them on Amazon for very little money, uh, overnight delivery, so you really should get those books. Um, he, Chris is also the co-editor uh, with Charles Perron of Brazilian Popular Music and Globalization, uh, which came out from L Routledge in 2001, and uh, with Idelber Avelar of Brazilian Popular Music and Citizenship, which came out from Duke in 2011. Uh, so uh, Chris, uh, Chris's work also includes a strong focus on, on popular music, but also on cinema. And he's bringing to us tonight a film that um, was produced not in Sao Paulo, where most of the other films that we've talked about, or Rio de Janeiro, where most of the other films that we talked about so far uh, were produced, but in, in Bahia, uh, which also happens to be a place of origin of, of Caetano Veloso. So uh, there's this connection there. And as Chris will tell us, uh, um, there is a strong connection between Meteorango Kit and the Boca do Lixo de Cinema, but how exactly that works. Chris is going to tell us now. Thank you so much for making the long trip from New Orleans to Frankfurt and sharing this film and your talk with us. Thank you so much, Vincent, and I, um, I really appreciate that introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to come all the way to, to Frankfurt. It's the first time I actually have ever been in Germany. I've had a wonderful week here, and um, I wish I could stay, actually. Um, and I want to also thank uh, Laura Teixeira uh, for that nice introduction and also for, for helping me around and having lunch with me the other day. And Lily Bush, who, who, who collected me at the hotel and, and brought me all the way to the university and is, has been around. I also want to give a, what we call a shout out uh, to my friend Silvia Ruggieri, who is a painter here, a local painter here and an artist in, in, uh, in Frankfurt, who I met in Chicago back in the late 1980s and early 90s, and uh, we've reconnected because of this trip. So it's been very special for me, as you can, as you can imagine. I'm always amazed when people introduce me as a, the specialist in Tropicalia because I feel in many ways like a dilettante, um, in the sense that I have I'm not a film specialist, or I work a lot on Brazilian popular music, but I'm actually not a musicologist per se. Um, I like to see these connections across fields, and perhaps you can s understand why this moment in Brazilian cultural history, particularly through the movement of Tropicalia, was such a fertile ground for me. But we're going to be focusing on one particular film, and what I wanted to do was introduce a, a couple of the, f the first two, basically the first two scenes, right, and then jump back and give a, 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 a sort of an overview contextualize it. So there, we're going to talk about the film very briefly and then contextualization, go back to the film. So this film, Meteorango Kid, came out in 1969 um, at a particularly uh, difficult moment in Brazilian um, history, as we will see. The open, in the opening scene, which I'm going to play shortly, which is shot in reverse motion, we are introduced to Lula, his name, the intergalactic hero, as the title of the, of the film informs us, who descends from a palm tree, ascends backward, again in reverse motion, onto a cross and hangs Christ-like Christ -like, under the scorching sun, framed by towering coconut trees as a heavily distorted electric guitar blares in the background. He imagined himself as Christ crucified on the cross, as a kind of sign of personal and generational sacrifice. But as you will notice in the scene that I'm going to play very shortly, this martyrdom is voluntary. There are no spikes that affix his hands to the cross. 
he seems free to go, but remains there for a full six minutes. This is about the amount of time in the beginning you can go out and get a glass of wine or use the bathroom or whatever. It's not going to change. Six minutes of him suffering on the cross. He seems free to go, but there he is for the six minutes while the credits roll. So, of, of course, this is a period where we see a lot of these reconfigurations of Christ figure, Pasolini, of course, and Jesus Christ superstar through this more or less 60s countercultural lens. And there's another little thing that I wanted to point out here, and it's not, I'm not going to show this part of it, but you'll see it in the longer version, that the censors, the Brazilian censors, required the director, who I haven't introduced, André Luis Oliveira, to add the message that everyone has a cross to bear in life, thereby framing the story as this sort of universalistic coming-of-age story, and kind of um, de depriving it of the specific sort of political meanings of that time. So after six minutes of watching Lula on the cross, as you'll see, there's a very quick cut with a rock drum roll and an ecstatic scream that accompanies a cut to the downtown of Salvador. Salvador is the capital of Bahia, by the way. Bahia, and I'll show you a map a little bit later, and sometimes I say Salvador, sometimes I say Bahia, I mean the same thing. Uh, Bahia, uh, which is the state, is oftentimes used to refer to the capital, Salvador. So we're, we're, we're in downtown Salvador. We hear police sirens blaring. Lula is walking through the center, center, city centers, and you will see photos of the Brazilian musician Caetano Veloso, particularly from that, f that actual concert that Vincent just referred to when he was singing É Proibido Proibir, it's forbidden to forbid, a slogan from the Paris uprisings, uh, May, May 68, that was then translated into Portuguese and made into a, a, a rock song, uh, and that whole diatribe against the students that didn't understand what he was doing. We see that image, and yet at the same time, the image, or the, the, the soundtrack, is of Janis Joplin singing, Oh Sweet Mary. So you have that sort of heterogeneity, that hybridity, that, 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 not, that disconnection between sound and image, but that are also, on some profound level, very connected. Then follows fast cuts between Lula, the, this protagonist, walking through modern commercial galleries of downtown, the downtown Salvador, apparently followed by a police officer, flashing to young people getting arrested, and then also the moon landing. Of course, it's 1969. All of this provides some context. So here we go with the first clip. So one of the things that's interesting to note is just it, precisely when the Mothers of Invention and with Janis Joplin's band tell me why, you see Caetano Veloso like with his arms up and this is when he's literally saying por que, right, to the students arguing with them. But here we are in Salvador in 1969. It's five years after the military coup um, which established an authoritarian regime. Uh, and this isn't part of the film, but at this time, a, a man by the name of Antonio Carlos Magalhães, who is a sort of a civilian av ally of the regime, had recently been appointed mayor with a sort of a modernizing impulse, developmentalist impulse. Lula saunters down the sidewalks and through the commercial galleries like a tropical hippie flaneur. A non-diegetic soundtrack of Rocket Countdown in English alludes to the moon landing. We share his sense of disorientation before a dizzying array of sounds and images, further exacerbated, as you will see after we screen later in the movie, with the frequent use of non-corresponding sounds. For example, and just keep this in mind, you can watch for it. As a propeller plane prepares to take off, we hear the whistle and that chug of a train. Small toy pistors, pistols produce the sound of, hemi, of heavy gunfire, the sound of high wind during a scene of total calm. These are the kinds of things that you'll see in the film, which oscillates between scenes from everyday life filled with anguish and repression, Brazil 1969, together with this dream world of Lula's own creation in which desires are fret, set free. <laughs> 
jumping from the gallery where he's walking around to the set of a TV station, an anchorman makes two absurd announcements. The first one is, a poison cake kills everyone in the city of God. Old men exchange spitballs in public. A civil servant, Mr. Abjias, injured while passing between them. We are clearly in the realm of fantasy as the reporter cuts to a news flash about Lula Bon Cabelo, grande estrela de todos os tempos. Lula, good hair, the greatest star of all time. So this becomes also a, a kind of a trope of the film, Lula's hair, his long hair, which he's very proud of. So in the second scene that I'm going to show you, we're at Teatro Castro Alves, premier, the premier theater of Salvador, a monument to post-war modernization in Bahia. He arrives on a donkey, Christ-like, thronged by fans who have come to see the opening of Tarzan y las Bananas de Oro, Tarzan and the Golden Bananas, a film he stars in. Under bright lights and before his adoring fans, Lula is ritually cleansed by two nymphs who use the occasion to advertise personal hygiene products. He uses Bayanu soap, the soap of the superstars. And here's that clip. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. This is, think of this as a, a trailer and, and not a spoiler, as I was worried about. Um, but I, I wanted to give a little bit of background to this film, and I know that many of you have been accompanying the whole series, and so you probably know a bit about the Cinema Marginal. Um, so some of it might be a little bit of a repetition, but I did want to uh, sort of mention back up and talk a little bit about that and contextualize the specific um, scene that he was coming from. So Andre Luis Vieira, uh, Oliveira, born in 1948, uh, made this film when he was 21 years old uh, after, after only making one short film the year before. He belonged to a generation together with Caetano Veloso, by the way, and, and the other tropicalists that grew up and reached adolescence during a very hopeful period of Brazilian history, during a post-war war, post -war experiment in democracy, culminating in the presidency of Juscelino Kubitschek. It was the age of Brasilia and Bossa Nova, the internationally claimed mid-century avant-garde poesia concreta, or concrete, concrete poetry, and also the time of the first victory of Brazil in the World Cup of 1958, led by the great Pelé. In other words, it was a time of great optimism in the late 1950s. In Bahia, and here I put up a map here just to, so you can all remind yourselves, the difference, here we have Rio and Sao Paulo down here, Salvador up there, Salvador the capital of Bahia, on the coast in the region known as the Northeast, the poorest region of Brazil. Bahia, in the 1950s, uh, they discovered petroleum reserves off the coast, uh, which uh, helped a kind of a, a mini boom, uh, economic boom, after decades of stagnation, uh, that underwrote a kind of a cultural renaissance. And there was a very forward-looking president of the local university, the Universidade da Bahia, named Edgar Santos, who created new schools of art, music, theater, and dance, mostly under the direction of European immigrants. So German immigrant Hans Joachim Kohreuter established the, sc uh, the School of Music. The Italian, the great Italian architect Lina Bobardi created the Museum of Modern Art, which in fact showed films, art house films, right? European and, and North American films uh, in conjunction with a local cinema club, the Clube da Cinema da Bahia, which was actually founded in, in 1950 by someone named Walter da Silveira. In other words, there was a milieu, right, of people that were connected and interested in what was going on uh, in the world in terms of film. At the, and, and indeed, by the end of the decade, there was a mini boom in local film that's sometimes called the Ciclo Baiano de Cinema, basically between 59 and 64, that produced films such as Bahia de Todos os Santos by Trigueirinho Neto, A Grande Feira by Roberto Pires, Pagador de Promessas by Anselmo Duarte, and Barra Vento by the great Glauber Rocha. Uh, 
In 64, toward, kind of at the end of this cycle, Hosha would release his great, one of his great masterpieces, Dios y Diablo na Terra do Sol, Black God, White Devil, which together with Nelson Pereira dos Santos' film adaptation of Vidas Secas, a novel by Graciliano Ramos from the 30s, placed the northeastern Sertão, and the Sertão would be that interior region of the northeast, which is very dry, uh, dr drought prone, and very poor. And these two films placed them, these, this region in the center of political consciousness for the Brazilian left. Okay, for, for those who were, even though they were living under a democratic regime under Kubitschek, felt that Brazil needed to revolutionize, right? Um, have a social revolution. And of course, the Brazilian cry was, was um, uh, agrarian reform. Oriented by what Glauber Rocha called the estetica da foma, the, the, fome, the, the aesthetics of hunger, um, all of these films, right, were, had a very sort of strong social um, consciousness, if you will. And like I said, the Sertão and even the coast, the, Bay, the, the coast which is much more African, uh, were very present in this first phase of Cinema Novo. Is particularly from these films that are identified with the Bayan cycle, right? And of course, we see a very strong debt to Italian uh, neorealism, Soviet films, and in a more general, diffuse general uh, ideological sense, a very strong connection and uh, to the Cuban Revolution. But these films that I'm that I just talked about also coincided with the military coup of 1964, which installed a US-backed anti-communist regime that implemented a program of conservative modernization involving multinational capitalism, infrastructural development, but also the suppression of labor demands and civil liberties. In response to civil society protest and also the emergence of an armed struggle the regime tightened its grip on power in night, starting around 1967, 1968. The regime suspended Congress, established strict censorship, and cracked down hard on the opposition. And this coincided also with this movement, Tropicalia, manifest in film, theater, visual arts, and most famously in popular music. We can make three general points, fleetingly, about this movement. One, it was a, obviously a crisis among left-wing artists and intellectuals, right? In a sense, there was a sense of being defeated, right, by a right-wing military regime. Second, you see a critique of what was known as the national popular paradigm, a certain kind of cultural nationalism that was very strong in the early 1960s especially, very anti-imperialist in, thr in thrust, anti-American more, more specifically, that would reject things like, for example, rock and roll music, right? So a rejection of that, right? As we see already, I mean, they're, here they are, you know, Janis Joplin and the Mothers of Invention is part of the language of Andre Luis. This is a result of tropicalism. And a certain kind of abandonment of the idea of the revolution for national liberation, okay? That, I think, by the late 1960s, and of course there's some that still maintain that idea, but in general, I think that's the way you might want to describe Tropicalia. And it was very much criticized by elements of the left, as you might imagine. And this had interesting, an interesting impact. In, tropical, in popular music, the tropicalists, Caetano, Gilberto Gil, Tom Zé, Gal Costa, in mixing elements of rock, bossa nova, samba, also Latin, other Spanish-American music, in a way we're able to transcend a conflict between what was known as, as Brazilian music, right? Mami Pebe, Musica Popular Brasileira, right? Uh, and identified very much with the national song tradition. And a more insurgent rock and roll movement that at that time in Brazil was known as Ye Ye Ye, right? Which came from the Beatles. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a lot of places in Latin America, in the first phase of rock, they called it yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And there was a real tension between Brazilian popular music and yay, yay, yay at that time. And the tropicalists seemed to kind of <laughs> transcend that and say, we can use electric guitar, incorporate elements of rock, and still make Brazilian music. <coughs> so this had a big impact, right? Uh, and it's worth noting that all of these guys were from Bahia, right? And were heroes of, of André Luis. So much so that he wanted to dedicate this, the, the film to Caetano Veloso, but at the very last minute he said, no, I'm going to dedicate this film to my hair, as you'll see. <laughs> so while in a sense Tropicalia resolved the field of popular music, in the sense of overcoming that division between rock and MIP Bay, right? It occasioned a rancorous split within Brazilian cinema. So this is something to keep in mind, that Tropicalia kind of had a different impact on each of the fields of artistic expression. So in, a, in, 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 in popular music, it tended to bring people together. It kind of resolved a question for many people. And in film, it had the opposite impact. There was an old guard of the Cinema Novo, Glauber Rocha, Joaquim Pedro de Andrade, Nelson Pereira dos Santos, Gustavo Dal, and a younger group, a little bit younger, not a totally different generation, but a slightly younger group of insurgents, Rogério Scanzella, Giulio Bressani, among others, later identified with what we'd call Cinema Marginal sometimes also known as Uji Gruji, right? Which was referring to a series of film that's sort of underground, right? The homophone of underground, which refers to a, fil a, a series of films produced between 68 and 73. So very briefly, as many of you probably already know, that Cinema Marginal rejected prevailing notions of industry standards, discarded populist and nationalist themes of, found in the Cinema Novo, embraced elements of lowbrow cinema, like pornographic, sci-fi films, horror films, most notably José Mar Mojica Mar Marins, or also known as Zé do Caixão, uh, who made these wonderfully inventive psychedelic horror films going back to the 1950s. He's actually still alive and producing. It also embraced what you might think of as the poverty of Brazilian cinema, right? It, almost a kitsch aspect of Brazilian cinema. So in one scene that I'm not going to show here, but you'll see it, Lula meets with a local film producer who's a family friend who invites him to act in a movie in exchange for a contribution from his dad. His, his formula for, for success, he tells Lula, is mulher nua tiro porrada peito bunda. In other words, this is what you need to do to make a film. You have to put in naked women, gunfire, fights, tits, and ass. At the same time, the cinema marginal was highly inventive, combining elements of debauch and experimentalism. It replaced the revolutionary impulses of cinema novo with visions of dystopia. dystopia. But we also notice a radical intertextuality in the cinema marginal in its references to several genres, noir, Western, musical, documentary, and the chanchada, the Brazilian slapstick comedy of the 1960s. So it's very much in line with what Robert Stamm, great film critic, uh, has called garbage aesthetics based on parody and pastiche. Fernan Ramos, Fernão Ramos, who I believe is going to be speaking in this series coming up, don't miss it, defines cin cinema marginal in terms of curtição e horror. Okay, and curtição, and I have a little bit of, of, a, um, of a definition here together with a very shameless promotion for my latest book, right there. Um, curtição in Portuguese, which we might think of, it comes from the verb curtir, right, to play with something, to have fun. A playful pursuit of pleasure and sensual joy. And this isn't really part of necessarily um, the criticism of this film, but it's very much related to this term desbunji, which plays a big role in my book, which is kind of the term that was used for the Brazilian hippie movement. And it liter it comes from desbunji, bunda in Portuguese means ass, right? And desbunji conveys something like losing one's ass, sliding through life on one's ass, 
or in the lingo of the counterculture, dropping out, right? So that's where the, the term that they would use, curtiso desbungi. These are part of the lingo of countercultural youth at that time. So Fernand Hamos it talks about cinema marginal as this kind of dialectic, maybe not dialectic, but this play between curtiso on one hand, this playful fun, this sort of debauch, right, uh, aesthetics, on one hand, and then horror on the other, right, which is very much informed by the local, um, by the local uh, context, right, and he and he cites this famous expression of political defeat and impetus and impot impotence uh, that we find in Scanzerla's the red, uh, the Bandido da Luz Vermelha, the the bandit of the red light, who says at one point. Quando a gente não pode fazer nada, a gente avacalha, which means when there's nothing else we can do, we ridicule, we make fun of things, right? That's all we can do at this point. So one thing to keep in mind in terms of this particular film, as it took place in Bahia, is that Bahia at that time precisely was becoming a kind of mecca for the Brazilian counterculture which involved young kids, high school, college age, the 19, you know, in their 20s, largely from the sort of southern, wealthier cities of Brazil, Rio, Sao Paulo, et cetera, Porto Alegre, who were attracted to Bahia for its African culture, or Afro-Brazilian culture, which was regarded as a kind of refuge from modern Western society of urban Brazil during the dictatorship. And yet what's interesting about this film, uh, Meteorango Kij, is that there's very little that marks the film as typically Bahian. There's no reference to Candomblé. Candomblé, of course, the Afro, great Afro-Brazilian religion, which Bahia is known for, renowned for, since the early 20th century internationally for Candomblé. There's no capoeira, right? The great fight dance that has now spread all over the world. I'm sure there's a half dozen clubs of capoeira right here in Frankfurt, right? Very much associated with Bahia. Um, there are no, there's no Bayanas, right? And here we have, actually, I wanted to show you. That. I love this photograph. It's in my book. These two hippies, right? You got the backpack. And what are they buying? They're buying acarajé. Acarajé is a street food originally from West Africa. It's called acara in West Africa. Transported to Bahia, it's become this, it's a very well-known street food. It's kind of an emblem of Bahian culinary identity. And there they are buying acarajé. There's no acarajé in Meteorango Kid. Um, no colonial era churches or forts. No shots of Pelourinho, the very famous historic downtown. No postcard images of Bahia, in other words. In one sequence, as you'll see, we hear Carmen Miranda's recording of Na Bahia, which tells of all the unique cultural riches to be found in Salvador. The Orishas, right? The, the, the gods of, of Candomblé. Dende, which is the oil that you need to use to make acarajé. Magia, magic, all of these references, right? That people associate, Brazilians and internationally as well, with Bahia. So none of those, you hear that in Carmen Miranda's voice, but it's together with a street scene <laughs> that's perfectly banal. I forgot to show this image. I love this of the hippies arriving in a beach town called Arembepi. Uh, but I'm going to continue and show you this wonderful street scene. You'll hear Carmen Miranda talking about the lovely, unique riches of Bahia. And what do you see is just a totally banal urban street scene of, Sal of, of Salvador. All right. And so I forgot to actually set this up and explain what you're about to see. But... Very briefly, um, you have this street scene where Lula encounters two of his friends. On one hand, you, had, you have Cavarinho and Zé. And another guy arrives, we don't know his name, and who doesn't know Lula, right? And Cavarinho, who we'll get to know very well in this film, says, hey, do you know Lula? And before he can make an introduction, this guy's kind of off to the side to Cavarinho says, is this guy Chinese or Soviet? Right, and this had real meaning in Brazil because it meant like were, were you of the PCB, right? The Bra 
the Brazilian Communist Party, or were you of the PC do Bay, which means were you of the Communist Party of Brazil? One, the first was Soviet, the other was Chinese. And so for a certain kind of uh, left, right, that was, that was very fractional, this was an issue. And of course for Caveirinha and that whole group, this is like, what a ridiculous thing to say, to ask, right? And he responds with this sort of barrage of insults, you know, basically, you know, saying, you know, you're being, you know, completely ridiculous. We don't care about this stuff at all, all right? Um, in the next scene that I actually have on the same slide, that's in some ways related because it, the two scenes follow one from one to another. So the, this first scene that I just showed you, you see this kind of political disengagement. They don't care about the Chinese, the Soviet, the... They're, they're, that's not what they're into. That's not their trip. We know what their trip is. Their trip is, as Zay says, when Zlula arrives, is, hey, check out this joint. Give it a smell, right? You hear that? We hear him saying that. And in the very next scene, they go to get a coffee. And here we have this commentary on film that's very interesting. Um, they're taking their coffee. And as you'll see, Zay looks out the window or out the door, and he's like, oh, this guy named Kleber is coming, like, oh, man, what a drag this guy is. And we soon find out why. Well, Kleber is bragging about the fact that <coughs> Glauber Rocha, none other than Glauber Rocha, who's this, you know, of course, this huge name in Brazilian cinema, originally from Bahia, has invited him to be an assistant director or something like that. And they just think it's like, and they, you can see the way they treat him. I'm not, I don't have to to translate for you. You'll, you'll see it in the film, but here's the scene. So he's very excited. He's going to become famous, right? He's going to go work with Glauber, and they're just like, they don't even want to hear about it. They don't really care, right? That's just not their thing. And so already, I think that Andres, Andre Luis, and this is not to say that he didn't like Glauber Rocha. Everybody was influenced by Glauber Rocha, of course. But there was also that moment in 68, 69, in which... <laughs> Cinema Novo wasn't that Novo anymore. It had become, if you will, passé, right? Some of them called it Cinema Novo Hiku, right? Or Nouveau Riche uh, Cinema, right? And so they weren't on the same, the same uh, boat. So at this point, we get to kind of in the middle of the film, and we reach the sort of key scene of the film. The three friends leave the café, they stroll down a cobbled stone street towards the lower city to the sound of the Novos Baianos. And the Novos Baianos is an important reference here. This is a local group from Bahia. They call themselves the New Bahians because they were coming on the heels of the tropicalists, Caetano and Gil, etc. And they were, of all Brazilian music at that time, were the most associated with the Brazilian counterculture, the hippie counterculture. They, they came in the early 70s to live on a commune where they basically, it was like a farm outside of Rio de Janeiro where they basically played music, smoked pot, and played soccer, like, you know, 24-7. At least that's the image that they portray, the Novos Baianos, and they played incredible music. And, and so they performed the sort of soundtrack, right, uh, for this whole film, okay? Oh, is it not working? No, no, no. I can use this. No, this is fine. I'm sorry. I always worry about my voice being too loud. No, it's just for the recording. Oh, sure. Okay, fine. I don't want to... Okay. Is everybody... Is that, is that okay, then? Okay. Excellent. Good. So, you'll see them. They go down the street, right? And they're obviously very contented and relaxed. And they're in the effective and sensual zone of Kurchi sound. Remember the word Kurchi sound. And they end up in Caveirinha's very sparse apartment in a very modest building. And they settle themselves on a mattress. And for the first time in the film, because there's a lot of chaos in this film, a lot of non-diegetic sound, diegetic sound, everything. And for the first time in the film, total silence as Caveirinha carefully rolls a joint with the kind of seriousness and purpose in contrast to his somewhat agitated, wild-eyed demeanor. And he lights up to a piece of music that I think everybody here will recognize. So I just, 
last week, to my delight, I discovered that um, Richard Strauss's The Spoke Zarathustra premiered right here in Frankfurt in 1896. You probably all know that already. Um, but of course, you probably also know that it, re it gained renewed fame in 1968 in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 for the opening of dawn, the opening dawn of man sequence, right, which heralds the invention of technology in the form of a bone used as a tool and weapon. In contrast, Oliveira deployed the fanfare in a kind of, I think, a kind of ironic, humorous fashion. I think it's a very funny scene, actually, to commemorate the initiation of a marijuana smoking circle, the ultimate leisure activity for countercultural youth. It's the epitome of Kurchisel. But this moment of youthful communion quickly dissipates when Zay, right, who's, who's that Zay right there, actually, enters a marijuana-induced paranoia trip. He frets about wasting his life and being lost. And instead of consoling him, Lula and Caverinha begin to ridicule him, saying to him, corta esse papo, which means shut up, right? And they just basically kind of alienate him and, and, and exacerbate that paranoia trip. Soon after that, Lula drifts into a fantasy world. And you'll see this, and it's a little bit jarring if you don't understand. All of a sudden, he goes from this sparse apartment where he's been smoking marijuana with his friends to sitting at a very bourgeois table. It's his home, and he's having coffee with his parents. And an insipid conversation ensues when a family friend arrives. She has just returned to Europe, which is, of course, a sign of prestige and wealth. Bored with this conversation, Lula turns to his father and he whips out a joint and says, Aceita uma maconhinha. Would you like a little bit of pot? And he, the father is absolutely outraged. He gets up and says, Seu moleque, you, you know, you, you rascal. The mother begins to scream. The father starts yelling, Delinquente, you delinquent. Lula runs to his ba bedroom, changes into a Batman suit. Robin is there right now, and this is a whole other subplot that we might get into during the conversation. Refuses to join him. He's just sitting there. And he runs back down, and he attacks his parents to the sound of the Batman theme song. After that, he returns to the apartment, right, or at least consciously, right? And Zay's paranoia trip has become even worse by that time. And he keeps on repeating, Minha vida, meu futuro, my life, my future. To which Caverinha responds, What are you waiting for? The uprising of the lower classes? Kiss the enchanted princess? Find the magic lamp? Instead of soothing their friend, they ridicule him as they begin to search for around the room to try to capture his future. Where is the future? Where is it? Where is it? Future, future, as if it's a little mouth. And at this point, Lula exclaims, just like the Red Bandit says, when you can't do anything, you ridicule and deride. So it's a very clear intertextual homage, if you will, to the Red, red Light Bandit. Zay wants to leave desperately by this time, but his two friends prevent him from reaching the door. Zula, uh, Lula picks up gets a gun and dares Zay, this guy here, to shoot him. When he refuses, Lula takes the gun back, taunts both of them, and actually ultimately and somewhat senselessly shoots Caverinha. Although the final denouement is one of Lula's fantasy. I mean, I don't think we can imagine that he really shoots him. It's, it's all in his trip, if you will. The scene is very disturbing as the communal right of sharing a dr joint so romanticized by the countercultural, the counterculture as a ritual of camaraderie devolves into violence, even though it's, it's imaginary, it's suggested to be imaginary. Perhaps more than any other scene in the Cinema Marginal, the whole thing, I would say, this scene captures that deployment that Hamus refers to of courtesan and horror. <laughs> 
So let me just see how we are in terms of time. Yeah, we are pretty much running out of time, and so I'm going to skip over some key scenes. Well, some scenes. I'm going to skip over some scenes and kind of cut to the end. This is supposed to take place in one day, in fact, of his life, even though we have all these flashbacks and everything. And in fact, he was going to call it The Cruelest of Days as a film, but then opted for The Meteorango Kid, which is actually the, a song by a guy named Tu Zeji Abreu, who's a well-known musician uh, there in Salvador. And he loved the song, and he, he, and he appropriated the title, but strangely <laughs> didn't use it in the film. Um, but you can find it online. Um, so after this day, and he has more adventures, as you'll see, uh, Lula returns home. And as you'll see, he's, you know, belongs to a kind of a bourgeois family, which is actually similar to André Luis's own circumstances. In the background, we hear the song by Caetano Veloso, The Empty Boat, which is actually in English, as you'll hear. Um, a mournful song um, that he composed early in 1969 while he was under house arrest. So both Caetano and Gil were arrested in late 1968 kept in confinement for two months, sent to Salvador where they remained in house arrest, and then finally exiled to London in June of 19, or July of 1969. So this was a whole album that he made while he was under house arrest. It's very interesting experimental record, but also mournful as you'll hear in this song that, that's in which he's singing again in English, from the stern to the bow, oh, my boat is empty. Oh, my head is empty. From the nape to the brow. From the east to the west, oh, the stream is long. Yes, my dream is wrong. From the birth to the death. Veloso's lament about emptiness, emptiness and disorientation contrasts dramatically with the visual sequence as Lula is greeted by a large gathering of family and friends, all elegantly dressed, who have come to celebrate his birthday. Lula slumps in a chair, annoyed and bewildered, as friends slap him heartily on the back, and his mother smothers him with hugs and kisses. The celebrants are completely impervious to Lula's estrangement, which further aggravates his misery, and intensifies his sense of emptiness. During this phase of military rule, which is sometimes called usufoku, the suffocation between, precisely between 69 and about 74, emptiness, or the void, vazio, as they say in Portuguese, was a dominant trope in Brazilian culture. Famously, in 1971, the journalist Zuanir Ventura would describe this sense of mal uh, malaise using the term vazio cultural, the cultural void, caused largely by censorship, repression, and the forced exile of artist and intellectual. And yet at the same time, as Wali Salomão, who's the, perhaps the greatest poet of that generation, vazies, right, or emptiness, the void, is a necessary condition for artistic reinvention. Suportar a vazies, he writes, to endure emptiness without fanfare, as the void has no need for it. So with this in mind, we might try to interpret the final scene, right? Now in forward action, uh, as Lula leaps out the, the, the cross, uh, leaps off the cross back uh, back where the film began and then climbs the coconut tree as if to abandon his self-imposed martyrdom and satisfy his thirst. But I forgot to play the clip here. This is the last scene. Okay, well, this is the last scene that I was referring to that actually kind of unwinds that reverse action shot from the beginning of the film, right? And as you'll see, the very last scene, right, shows him jumping off that cross and climbing back up the coconut tree as if to quench his, his thirst. So I'm going to leave off right now because I want to be able to get to the film, but thank you for, for listening, and I hope it 
serve to introduce the film, and uh, I hope that we have more opportunity to discuss the film after you see it. It's only 80 minutes long, so, um, and I think you'll find it quite entertaining. Thank you. So please welcome uh, Chris Dunn and Vincent Rediger. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead. I'll have an extra microphone and I'll bring it over to you guys. We already have a question. Okay, we have a question right away, please. Um, I hope I'm not interrupting the flow. Like, if you want to have a conversation, no, first. go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, not at all. Um, well, no, first nothing of all, better than to start and then <laughs> from the audience to start off with, okay. please. Um, thank you for um, your talk. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I actually wondered watching the film. Um, well, I mean, I found it was a little bit racist and obviously misogynistic somewhat. But what really confused me was I felt it was really homophobic and I didn't really know where, it, like, I don't, I have no idea about the subculture and what was common and what wasn't. But I really didn't see the point of it, you know, like it was a leftist thing yeah. and revolutionary and it was just so derogatory towards so many people. I felt really taken aback. And that was actually the question that I was hoping to get. <laughs> because I didn't talk about that in my introduction. I didn't prepare you for that. Um, there was an earlier iteration of my presentation that went into all of that. And that's something that I'm going to confront in the, in the written when I write it up for an article. Because it's a very troubling aspect of the film. Um, and there's so much about it that sort of exuberant and that at the same time there's part of me that wants to identify with Lula right because he's this free spirit right but at the same time and I got the sense every time I watch it even more and then I was watching it tonight I was like it dawned on me he's a total monster right and maybe that's a little bit too moralistic and but that was my sense in watching it tonight and it disturbed me so much that actually I've been writing to the director to ask him about it <laughs> because it's like, where does that hatred on the part of Lula come, f you know, to in, in, in relation to Duda, right? Who is this friend of his who's clearly gay. And he responded very sort of... Um, Sincerely, I felt that that at the and this gets to the question that you're trying to raise, which is like, what is the context? And the context is, and then in Brazil it, today, certainly, I mean, there's a lot of homophobia. In the 1960s, even more, right? And so this is actually one of the. In a sense, it's very disturbing and troublesome, and I understand why there's parts of it that you probably, you know, are hard to watch, but that in, in some ways is also sort of an interesting commentary as well, because we're used to thinking of the counterculture as this moment of liberation, right? This moment of where some of the sexual and racial uh, preconceived notions and 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 hang-ups, if you will, right? Are we're liberated from them? And this is something I found in my in my research and in my book that I talk about. That in fact, there's profound sexism and homophobia within the counterculture. Maybe that doesn't come as a surprise, right? But here you have this guy who is, on some level, he identifies himself as a hippie, as an outsider, as a marginal. So we want him to, to be sympathetic to gays and to blacks and whatever. But in fact, at the end of the day, he's this bourgeois character. He's this bourgeois white guy. And, you know, it's so interesting that you commented first that it's not only this, the homophobia, but it's the racism. And this actually, it's only the, for the first time that I realized that scene in the beach where he comes and he addresses these black fishermen as macacada, right? A, a, a barrel of monkeys. And it's this sort of casual racism, right? That's kind of like, it passes very quickly, which is why I didn't really notice it before. 
But again, it gets back to that, I think, a point, and, and I'm not quite sure how conscious the director himself was of it at the time, in which Lula, even though he's this marginal character, he's inherited all of the... Um, some of, the, or not all of them, but many of the conservative attitudes towards sexuality, towards race, that are proper to upper class Bahian society. And that's what makes the film, in a way, the challenge of the film, because at the end of the day, he's called the intergalactic hero, and yet he reminds me more and more of like Makunaima, for those of you who know Brazilian literature. He's the hero with no character, in the sense of he's, not only is his character amorphous, but he's like what they call in Brazil, sem carácter, like which is means on the, it's got a negative resonance that he's he's kind of got a bad character, in a sense, and he lives by the pre the pleasure principle, right, all the time. You know, his friend kills himself. He knows that he's partially responsible for it, and yet he goes and makes love with the his friends sister during the wake, you know, with this very sort of mischievous grin on his face. And so I think that uh, that's part of the challenge of the film, if you will. Do you want to add to that? <laughs> or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually do. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is not a nice guy um, in this film, and probably ever. Uh, yeah, two things. Um, uh, Andrea Luis is obviously fascinated with Caetano Veloso. And, uh, you know, there are all these references, uh, several quotes. And actually, you know, one of the main references in the film is that particular diatribe yeah. that we talked about and that I brought up uh, in, in the opening statement where he basically insults the retrograde students for their bad taste. And and so that seems to be a crucial moment for Andre Luis. Um, <clears throat> and then he, uh, in the ending of the film, he quotes one of the film, the, the Empty Boat, that song from Gaetano Veloso. In terms of the homophobia, that obsession is very interesting because part of, of Gaetano Veloso's uh, persona, of course, is that uh, he's also, there's a queer side to him. Uh, that you know he makes sometimes quite explicit in some of his music, particularly in the early seventies. Uh, but that, in a way, is already part of this, uh, his his stage performance uh, during, I would say, during the Tropicolia phase. Yeah, absolutely, and and so part of the challenge that that Caetano Veloso in his performance poses to the norms of Brazilian culture is precisely. Um, the the transgression and the challenge to the homophobia of of Brazilian culture. So he sort of you know crucifies himself, if you will, um, uh, and 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 uh, develops a queer performance that that is uh, you know ambiguous in its in its meanings, but actually very daring in terms of how it confronts and situates itself within a within what is clearly a. a, um, a, a you know, a culture laced with homophobia. So, um, I'm. Uh, this is a film in which homophobia plays an important role. I'm not sure that the film itself can be uh, categorized as inherently homophobic. I think. I think it's it's sort of a acting out and performing of the, of those attitudes, and um, definitely those are the attitudes. I mean, André Luis is the son of a, an upper-class Bahian, or upper-middle-class Bahian bourgeois white person in one of the poorest states in Brazil, uh, and one that has a very strong, uh, you know, uh, component of African culture, of which, strategically, we don't see a whole lot in the film. I mean, I... I yeah, this is part of my talk that I... I didn't, I, well, I was kind of breezing through it and there are parts that I didn't, I didn't dwell on, but the whole question of the representation of Bahia is very interesting in this film because on one hand you could say, and this is my first reaction when I saw it, it's like what a alienated film this is. I mean, here we are, it's Bahia, it's, an, it's 80%, 85% Afro-Brazilian, right? It's a, it's a profoundly 
African Afro Afro Brazilian city, and all of uh, so much of the cultural production that came out of that city, going back to the 1930s, if you remember the the novels of Jorge Amado, you know, the paintings of Caribe and the, the f wonderful photographs of Pierre Verger, the French photographer who lived there for most of his life, um, the music of Dorival Caymmi and the Tropicalists and, 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 um, and then the films of the, the so-called Ciclo Baiano that I talked about in the early 60s. They portray that. That's what they're kind of focused on is the popular classes, if you will, right, the, which are Afro-Brazilian, right, and portraying that. Baja Vento is a great example of that in the work of Glauber Rocha. And so then you come to Meteora Anuco Kid, and that's all absent. And so you could say on one hand that it's a film that's very alienated from the city that it is representing, and that in some sense that alienation um, is, a, if you will, a reflection of the class position of the director himself, right? And that milieu from which he comes, right? So at that time, in the late 1960s, most of the people that were at the university were white. You know, most of the people that had access to, you know, uh, cultural production were, were white. Not all of them, and you have middle-class Afro-Brazilians from Bahia, like Gilberto Gil, famously, and others, right? But in general, it was a class stratified society that had a small white minority and middle class and a very large black underclass. And so you could think about it in that way. On the other hand, you can also read that absence as a certain kind of critique in itself. And I would argue that that's possible in the sense that at that time precisely, but also going back decades, but more and more under the military regime, there was an effort to, in a sense, appropriate and capture those symbols of black culture, candomblé, capoeira, samba, carnival, as a, um, as, a, as a kind of a tableau of racial harmony in the city. It's what is sometimes today is called bayanidaji, right? Bayanness, right? The discourse of bayanness is all about the celebration of a depoliticized black culture and also racial mixture at the same time. And so those are the, a lot of the themes that we see in Jorge Amado, the themes that we see in Caribe, the, theme, the themes that we see in Pierre Verger, the themes that we see in Dorival Caymmi, the musician. These are the dominant images of Bahia. And those are absence, but they're profoundly, in a, if you will, profoundly ideological, right? Um, and so you can see it from both ends that in a way ignoring that side or, or not focusing on it was this, as as Vincent said, a statement in itself? If I if I might add one little thing uh, to this, I mean, um, uh, two two little uh, two, two two more elements. I mean, there's the, the famous notion of racial democracy uh, proposed by Gilberto Freire, the, the sociologist from the 1930s, which is sort of a celebratory, affirmative view of Brazilian society. Which glosses over all the uh, you know lingering racism that that there still is in Brazilian society, and so to to do a film in Bahia that is so radically uh, uh, you know different from the Bahiani Dodge uh, um, representation, uh, as as uh, Chris was just saying, is is in a way a statement in itself. Um, and uh, another context that there is this explicit re reference to Ruggiero's Canzella and uh, the Red Light Bandit. And if you remember the Red Light Bandit, uh, that film in itself was already a critique of Glauber Rocha and and the Cinema Novo and the kind of you know, movement of the Cinema Novo outside of the cities to, you know, the countryside or the slums and, and uh, the, the, the aesthetics of representing the poor in, you know, in, in the hope of generating a kind of revolutionary dynamic just by simply giving a voice to the marginalized. And uh, if, if, if a film in the late 60s chooses this kind of perspective, where the marginalized people don't get that kind of voice. It, it is implicitly also, and there are all these re explicit references to, to Glauber Rocha and to, to Ruggiero's Cancelo, um, it also formulates a critique of that kind of cinema or that kind of revolutionary optimism tied to the representation of the popular classes. So in, in that sense, it's a very dark film. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> I would say, and very dark for a 21 year old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the situation is hopeless, but not serious. As Zizek likes to say, not that right. I want to adore Zizek, but that I like that right. line. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if, if I may add one little note, I mean, uh, this was a very productive question, you realize right. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Toute proportion gardée, comme disent les Français. Um, the film made me think of Zéline, uh, Louis Ferdinand Zéline, the, the French writer who is a despicable human being. Uh, a, a raging anti-Semite, but one of the great uh, uh, innovators of French literature uh, in that he brought the argot, the, the, the everyday language, slang into French literature. And his, his novels are, you know, first often first-person uh, narratives, and they're populated with really people you don't want to know, uh, attitudes you don't want to be confronted with, but they're out there and they exist. And it's it's a in 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 all their seeming affirmativeness, there these novels are a, are a fundamental critique of a certain kind of petit bourgeois milieu, exactly the kind of petit bourgeois milieu that that Céline comes out of. So uh, you know, as despicable as he was as a non as as a figure outside of literature. Uh, he sort of got ahead of himself in writing and, and formulated a critique of precisely what was problematic about himself as a figure. And and I think there's a reading of that film that, that you could propose oh, that goes in a Perhaps only, only with the difference that André Luis Oliveira himself, I don't think, shares that homophobia. I think, yeah. that, or, I think that it was, it was, a, it was a problem. A problem is not the word. It was an issue that he wanted to explore at the time in a way that was... Uh, I think very it ended up being very disturbing, but I think he, the way he tells it to me, at least, that it in itself by broaching the question, right, of homosexuality and how it's dealt with in society among men, right, was in itself, um, uh, if you will, revolutionary. In itself, it was it caused a polemic, right. Um, and to get back to what you're talking about, I think, which is very apropos, I think that what you see, this is related to a certain kind of tropicalist um, process, if you will. Going back to the earlier phase of the sort of national populism, where you had this great faith in the revolutionary p potential of the of the people, the upovo, the, the working classes, the peasants, and that generated a lot of these heroic narratives uh, that were sort of optimist, very optimistic in a sense, and romanticized. The tropicalist break is one in which the these artists that are essentially middle class, instead of pro pro projecting their desires their, for revolution, right, are invited in a sense to look at themselves as a, and their cultural upbringing, right, with all of its blind sides, if you will, um, and all of its um, profoundly uh, retrograde attitudes, right? Um, I think that that's part of the tropicalist aesthetic, is this sort of looking inward. And so then you get these figures like Lula, who are, in the end of the day, not at all heroic. They're, they, at the end of the day, you, they're, they're kind of monstrous. And that's part of that operation of tropicalist self-critique, I think. Thank you for that wonderful question. <laughs> I'm sure there's more like that out there. <laughs> you have more questions right away. Yeah, yeah, oh. that's a good one. If, you, if it, we'll point. have a lot more vampires in this series, yeah, that's uh, a we already trope, had some. a trope of the cinema marginal. Yeah. There's some scenes that are not very well developed, and the beach scene I think is one. Um, it's it, it's hard to say what you know what he was trying to get at there, other than these the casual racism and implied you know homophobia. But it's so quick, and it, it's it's not clear where he goes. And then the other is the vampire, and what what the vampire represents other than that vampire is a very 
recurring motif in Cinema Marginal. This is a great film by Ivan Cardozo called Nosferatu no Brasil, which is wonderful, 30 minutes long, um, and and very funny in a lot of ways. Um, in some ways, I don't know, you might think of the, that vampire as a kind of alter ego to Lula, right? Uh, this figure who's sort of stalking around the city, attacking people, attacking women particularly, um, but also um, uh, profoundly anguished, right? The anguished vampire, the loser vampire, not the vampire that is, you know, mysterious and attacks and then flies away and, you know, goes back to the coffin and sleeps. No, the, the vampire that just is totally a fuck up, right? And I think that that's where, that's what that character is. You know, not this, this very unromantic vampire, this grotesque vampire, this vampire that fails and is grotesque. And this is something that Fernão Ramos talks about in his wonderful film. Fernão, is, I've said this now twice, is going to be talking here. Um, is Jan January 25th. <laughs> right? Mark the date. <laughs> A recurring theme, and in, in, in I hadn't really realized this before in Cinema Marginal, is this sort of the figure that is like eating and then um, it's like drooling the food, you know, and in this kind of grotesque uh, operation. And you see that very clearly in the, in the vampire. In the end, he's reduced to, to eating an apple with ketchup. Uh, with ketchup, right. In, in order to, to, to get the drooling just, effect. Just because, you know, you know, he's not very good at biting people in. <laughs> confuses boys and girls and right um again i mean uh leo Filippa is going to be uh on here in in the summer and he'll talk about nosferatu do brasil uh but his starting point is uh after 1968 there's a lot of vampires in brazilian culture yeah and and uh you know alongside the anthropophagia this seems to be one of the, the key motives uh for understanding that cultural cultural moment um i mean w one of the things that that we come back to looking at these films and talking about them is is uh sound and sound and image montage uh none of these films are shot with direct sound um not none of the films that we've seen so far um and uh they're most of the time they're very carefully edited in terms of the sound image relationship um <clears throat> one of the reasons why they do it is it's easier even though i mean the, most of this film was shot on 16 millimeter and uh at the time it would have been quite easy to have direct sound but they chose not to so uh, uh the, the choice was to uh edit um you know edit the sound and add the sound into post-production uh face and um i always find that very interesting that the loose coupling of, of sound and image in these films can you say something about it since you're so well yeah i mean i think that music um i mean in this case they're clearly they're coming out of uh so many people have done it before from the Euro european side obviously they're looking at godard um but especially Glauber Rocha, who used that to great ex effect in, in Terra in Transi especially. Um, I think that in the, in the case of this particular film, there is this, as you said before, a very strong uh, attachment to the Baianos. And I mean Caetano Veloso, Gilberto Gil. Gilberto Gil, by the way, is the one, the author of that very interesting experimental piece called Objecto No Identificado, that, that this kind of sound collage that you hear sort of in the middle of this, right, you know, right after that scene where he's at the university and he's going through those halls, and that's uh, by Gilberto Gil, also produced while he was under house arrest in 1969. But also then the Novos Baianos, which is this emergent group that's coming up, that's kind of more part of his social milieu. And I think that... Um, I think that plays an important role in terms of sort of non-diegetic non sound, right? And it's it, 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 it certainly when you get to the Novos Baianos, it's that it's that spirit of the curtisão, right? The enjoyment, right? And the Novos Baianos are that side of the counterculture, right? Most of their songs are very upbeat. They're um, they're fun. They're not homophobic. They're not racist. They're just kind of like these. Um, very exuberant uh, 
uh, ludic sambas, rock sambas. And so that's one part of the Bahian counterculture. And then Meteorango Kid has a little bit of that in it, in it, and it's connected to it. And that scene of them like going down the street, that cobblestone street, you know, the three of them, and and that song is playing, and it's this really nice moment, right? That I think represents it. Um, and so clearly there is that that connection that's very strong to the music of Bahia and the popular music of Bahia that plays a role. But in a sense, it's more incisive when it comes around to the Caetano and especially Prohibido Prohibir. Mm. And I had actually forgotten how much he cites that, which is this live recording of Caetano that became very famous because, because it happened to be recorded. It was a live concert. And he goes into this diatribe that becomes this very important statement um, of Tropicalia in relationship to the left. Now, we shouldn't rem- imagine the tropicalists as these right-wingers, not at all. They were eventually, Caetano and Jill were arrested by the regime and sent into exile, but they also had this very tense relationship with the, com- particularly the communist left and this, you know, some of the students that were associated with, with the Communist Party and uh, based on kind of aesthetic approaches. And so he clearly made a conscious effort in sort of inserting that into the film because, as I you know, tried to show in, in, this is in my first book, that the Tropicalia was this court kind of inaugural moment of the, of the counterculture in Brazil. Mm. So that reference was very important. Yeah, I mean, the, it's very much also a film about, let me put it really you know, polemically, the ridiculousness of a certain kind of political left. The, the, yeah. They're making fun of, you know, this organized student movement. and Yeah, and it, it gets all, it's that whole work where it gets back to esculhambar, right, which means to kind of ridicule, but in this way that's very carnivalesque, right? This kind of mixing up of things. And so even the terms in which that protest is happening at the school are totally ridiculous, right? First, we, we get to the school, and one of the students says, oh, you have to help us. They're trying to expel the reactionary students. No reactionary students were being expelled in Brazil at that time. It was the leftists that were being expelled. So that's already this, con- it sows this sort of confusion into it. And then you have this guy who stands up, and he starts railing about the waiters, right, at the canteen, which shows a certain kind of class, class privilege, certainly, but also like the, oh, it's all about the waiters, right? And those, those weren't the terms that students were protesting in Brazil. So there is this kind of way in which that is being ridiculed. And I can imagine that if you were sincerely involved in a left-wing opposition in 1969 in Brazil and you saw this film, you probably wouldn't like it very much. Yes. But... Um, I think that part of the point is that by 69, that opposition had largely been dismantled, except for the armed resistance, which continued until the early 1970s. And so that's where you get back to that scanzerla, when there's nothing less to, left to do, all there is to do t- is to ridicule and disparage. This the kind of turn to this kind of bitter irony, but also this kind of... Um, you know, fun, if if you will, or that's not the word. The the uh, a kind of uh, kind of um, playfulness, mm-hmm. right? That I guess the the the, lo- the longer view is that that can be regenerative, right? So that gets back to the point that Wally Salomon was saying that there was this space of the sort of cultural void and the early 70s, where there's a sense of this project being pl- completely at an impasse, but that in his view, those moments can be very important for artists, right? In terms of embracing or enduring a void to come through it to produce something else later on. Um, dramatically, the most interesting character in that, in, in, in that scene, in the protest scene for me, was the boring guy with the glasses 
because uh, you, you'd always fear that he get the, gets the microphone and starts talking because that's when all the enthusiasm dies. Right, right. You know, he's, he's the serious guy, and he's, he's the guy who, you know, would organize the party, but it would kill off the entire movement. Right, right, right. So I, I like the dialectics of, you know, the facetious uh, right. student leader and, and the guy who sort of, you know, represented serious organizing. And it's a... It's a- it's a, it, a film that really makes sense in that point in 1969. It's a, for the same reason it wouldn't make sense in 1975 mm. or 1974 when that energy that was more invested in those kinds of discussions now changed was renewed or the late 70s. So it's a very specific moment, that 69, which is that moment of utter defeat for for the left mm-hmm. and that and so you get these kinds of attitudes that and then we look at them now and they're like oh this looks like a beku sing saida like a dead end mm-hmm. right and in a sense maybe that's what this film is about is just saying maybe at there's some points in history where there are dead ends and you just have to confront that mm-hmm. i think that's kind of part of that film as yeah. well there's nothing redemptive about the film no yeah, I I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about is that we've been watching a lot of first films. Uh, there's a, a lot of first films happening in that in that period, and a lot of the really interesting cinema marginal films are early films or first films or maybe second or third films. So there's there, there's that particular energy of, of, of the beginners and of the breakaways. But uh, as I was just listening to you, I was thinking of another... Um, term proposed by someone who's actually from Frankfurt, Wolfgang Schievelbusch, uh, has written a beautiful book on the culture of defeat, uh, where uh, he basically studies the kinds of rituals that happen after a big military defeat. And one of the things that he's interested in is, you know, the defeat of the French army against the Prussians in 1870, which led to a whole lot of dancing, you know, (laughs) endless partying, endless mindless senseless partying and and you know it would probably be interesting to to certainly look at this film uh, under the rubric of it's the okay. culture of the fit antonio calado the great brazilian uh novelist has a, a book that's called bar don juan uh, written in, i believe published in 1970 or 71 and it opens with the epigraph that you know in the moments of deceit defeat it's a good time to open a bar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Culture of defeat. All right. And with that. <laughs> and with that, we call it a day. Thank you very much for coming, for uh, participating in the debate. And uh, the series continues January 11th. Exactly. With uh, Ismael Javier, who is the doyen of Brazilian film studies. And he will talk about a film that we've uh, referred to quite a bit in the series, um, Terram Transe, by Glauber Rocha. And uh, I hope you'll all be back. Uh, and happy holidays. Exactly. Yeah. So, a good uh, new year. I hope to see you all again uh, January 11th. Happy holidays. And uh, yeah. See you next time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, for being with us tonight. It was a great honor. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all again next year. The series continues until July. So um, there's a lot of films and interesting uh, talks still to come. Tropical Underground. Thank you very much.